Let all God's people say amen. Amen. Yes. I want to encourage you to turn with me, please, in your Bibles to the book of Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy chapter 6. And we will be there in that passage in just a moment. Uh, Deuteronomy, the fifth book from the beginning. If you're navigating uh, new territory, five books in. Deuteronomy chapter 6. And we'll be there around about verse 4 in just a moment. As we prepare for the study of God's Word, I simply want to say from my heart on a day like this, to all of you for whom this applies, happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day to each of you. Uh, I pray that you are mindful of the mystery of this room every time we gather on a day like this. Pastorally speaking, I look out and I see... So many different stories being lived every week. But on a day like this, it's especially beautiful to me. You know why? Because I see sometimes visitors from out of town visiting mom. I I see uh, the bright smiles on the new mothers. I see uh, as we dedicate our babies uh, before the Lord. And I'm also mindful. Some of you are thinking about a mother who no longer is among us but who is with the Lord. I know you're thinking about her. I know that for many of you, your hearts are filled with gratitude and you miss her. (laughs) And for many of you, your hearts are filled with all kinds of emotions as you think about motherhood. Some of you want to be a mother and biology has kept you from it. I know. And some of you have attempted to be mother and have had trauma and trial that has kept you from that experience, I know. But do you realize the power of what happens when all of us in our interactions with motherhood or fatherhood come into this room? Here's what happens. We are reminded that despite how filled with joy we are with mothers and fathers, despite how complex some of those emotions may be on a day like this, we are reminded that Jesus is the center of our joy, that he is the reason laughter will break apart the darkness. He is the center of our joy. So we gather all of those experience here to, experiences here today together as we lean into the sacred word. We are in the middle of a series, and that series is anchored in the reality that Jesus is the center of our joy. We've been saying for these several weeks that the church of Jesus Christ is intended to be the visible presence of the risen Christ in this world. That means if the world is to know that he is alive, the world will only know that he is alive through the lived experiences of those of us who call him Lord, through our changed lives for the ways that our lives have been transformed to look more like him in this world. And in this series, we've been trying to imagine what it might mean specifically, locally, right here at this address, 6910 McGinnis Ferry Road, for the living, breathing, risen Christ to actually become actualized in our lived experiences. And today... The message that the Lord has placed on my heart as a specific audience. At first glance, it would seem as if I'm speaking directly to moms and dads. But you know what we just did a few moments ago? Every one of us in this room stood up and said, we will all be mom and dad to these kids. We will all partner in raising up a new generation of faith among those who are the youngest among us. So really, this message is for all of us because there could be nothing more powerful than to to have our youngest on the stage and for this congregation to stand to their feet in in solidarity to say, we will raise them up in the love of Jesus. So today, the message that God has placed on my heart is, what does it mean to be raised in church? Raised in church. Now the passage that I want to read comes from Deuteronomy. It's Deuteronomy chapter 6. And we're going to begin in verse 4. Would you 
hear these words as I read them aloud. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. What does it mean to be raised in church? Now, that passage that I just read for us is what we refer to in Scripture as the Shema. The Shema is a prayer in Judaism. It's prayed twice a day, once in the morning and once in the evening. It is an anchoring prayer. It is a a framing prayer that when you pray it, you are reminded who you are and whose you are. When you pray the Shema, you are reminded of what our responsibility is if we are to be known as people of God. Shema. And the word Shema is simply a Hebrew word. It means to listen or to hear. Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echud. Hear, O Israel. Listen up, O Israel. Lean in and pay attention closely, O people of God, because what is coming next is everything. That's the Shema. What is coming next is everything. And what is coming next in verse 5? Love. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. I find it interesting that of all the things that are most important in the framing prayer of the people of God, it begins and ends with love. In Hebrew, the word is ahava. Ahava is not just any any kind of love. Ahava is used throughout the Hebrew Bible to describe a variety of kinds of love, but it's a love of great intensity. What does it mean to be the people of God? It's to be a people of intense love. Abraham had ahava for his son Isaac. It's a, it's a parenting love. Jonathan and David had ahava for each other as friends. It's a brotherly love. The king of Persia had ahava for Esther. It was a passionate love. And the people of Israel, as one body, unified together, had ahava for their leader, for King David. Ahava is described in a variety of ways because ahava is the kind of love that comes from God. It's divine love. In all its varied multiplicity of expressions, it is divine love. It's the kind of love that God describes having for humankind. But there's one nuance about Ahava love. It's this. Ahava love is more than just a feeling. It's more than just affection. Ahava means having a kind of affection that leads to action in order to express that affection. It's not a feeling. It's a function. To have ahava when commanded in the Shema, love. Take action to express your love of God in this world with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. In other words, with everything that is in you, God longs for you to love God with the very same kind of love God has given to you. In other words, do something about the love you have with God. Live it out. Express it. Show it. Demonstrate it in tangible ways. Now, this is the kind of love that we want our kids to have. Am I right? Isn't this the kind of love that we want to raise our children to know intimately? We want our kids to grow up knowing that they are saturated by the ahava of God. 
that no matter what they do or where they go or how they fall or fail, nothing can change the fact that they have been loved with an intense divine love. So much so, so much so that it saturates them to the extent that it begins to overflow in their lives and they learn to align their lives with the Ahava of God so that they love their neighbor as God would love. They love their spouse as God would love. They even love their enemies as God would love. Is that not what we want our children to understand as they grow? Is that not the kind of love that we long to develop here among us as people of faith as we raise our children in church? The trouble is they won't know it unless we show it. They won't know it. (laughs) You're not born knowing how to interpret the Ahava of God. You're not born understanding that you are loved by God. You're not born with the interpretive lens by which to see, to view, and understand, oh, that's because God loves me. No, you have to be taught, shown, demonstrated. And this is why the Shema continues. It doesn't just say, make sure that you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. It goes on to say something about how we deal with children who need to be exposed to that kind of love in the world. We pick up the next verse. We read these words. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Watch this. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. I love the word that's used there. Maybe the most important word of this whole passage, after all the ahava and all the love that we're told to have on our hearts, maybe the most important word in this whole passage when it comes to knowing what it means to be raised in church is that word impress. Verse 7 A, impress them on your children. Impress them. What what does it mean to impress upon your children? Now, that's the NIV that I just read, the the New International Version. But other versions read it this way. We read words like, like, speak to them, teach them, teach them repeatedly. Repeat them diligently. Those are, these are other words that are used to describe that Hebrew word, impress these teachings upon your children. But I don't even think those words do it justice. Can I just give you an illustration of what I believe the Shema is calling us to do with our children? So a few years ago, when I was finishing up my my doctoral work, I told a group of senior adult ladies here at our church, hey, in a few weeks, I have to defend my, my dissertation. Will you pray with me? Pray for me about that. And they agreed to pray. But one of the women, Mally Gillum, you remember old Mally? She's gone to be with the Lord now. She's in that great cloud of witnesses looking among us right now. She showed up at my office with a gift. I opened up the gift. Rhonda's laughing because she knows what that gift was. She showed up at my office (laughs) with this. And I opened it up. I said, Mally, my word. <laughs> what are you, where have you been? What, what are, she says, it's a sword. I said, I know it's a sword. I, what, I said, where'd you get that? She said, on that internet. <laughs> Mally, by the way, and don't get, don't get scared. Okay. Mally, by the way, is the one who lived in our neighborhood. And one day I noticed on Facebook, she had, she had posted, she had posted, she was trying to give a private message to a friend of hers. Hey, just come through my garage. The code is, 
So I called Mally right away. I said, Mally, what are you doing? You just told everybody your code. Oh, did I? I didn't know. I didn't know. And so I said, well, can you, you just need to erase it. You just need to delete it. She goes, I don't know how to do that. I said, can I have your code? So I got her, her passcode and I had to hack into Mally's account to delete it so that she wasn't, you know, visited by unwanted visitors. I said, why did you bring me a sword? And she said, well, you told me that you have to defend your dissertation. <laughs> I said, right on. Okay. So you know what I did? She said, you can't defend your, your dissertation if you're unarmed. You have to be prepared. So I went to my, my oral uh, defense, and I, I, placed, I placed this thing on the table. I did. I did. And I passed. <laughs> yes. Right. Thank you, Mally. And the reason I'm telling you this story today is because do you know that in Hebrew, there is a word that is used to describe what it means to impress this love upon your children, impress this teaching upon your children. Here's the Hebrew word. The Hebrew word, technically in the Hebrew Bible, is uh, wishanantam. Wishanantam is a word that means what I told you a moment ago, to teach or speak, to repeatedly speak, repeatedly teach. But do you know I did a little extra digging? I went down this, this rabbit hole to see what the root word is that forms this bigger word. And the root word is shanan. Shanan is the root word. Do you know that when shanan is used all through the Hebrew Bible, how it's defined and what it's used to describe, it's used to describe what it means to wet or sharpen a sword. Which means the Shema is saying every time you expose your child to the love of God, every time you bring them to an environment in which we remind them through song, Jesus is the center of my joy. You're sharpening their faith so that they understand as if they are being prepared for battle because they are. The Hebrew word in the Shema that commands us to impress upon our children the teachings, the law, the commandment, the way of life in God is to so sharpen them that they become like sharpened swords prepared for battle because they are. Our children are in battle all the time. They are currently in a battle for their minds a battle for their heart's affections. They're in a battle for what it means to be alive in this world and where their value rests. They are constantly at war every morning they wake. They're born into it. And can we just confess that these children who we just dedicated are being born into a world with challenges the likes of which you and I could never fathom would exist? And then you know what we do because we're good at this. In the midst of a world where they are constantly inundated with images and, and graphic images and, and impressions on who they are and voices about who they should not be and voices about what they should do and where they should go, in the world in which they are born, inundated by images and messages like that, then sometime along the way, well, we give them a device. Age 10, maybe? I don't know. Eight? Oh, it's fine because I've put filters on mine. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And we put in their pockets. I heard one pastor describe it this way. We give them for their 10th birthday porn in their pockets. And it's not just even porn. It's, it's, it's images about what it means to be human and what it means to be in community and what it means to have value in this life. And we think to ourselves, yeah, but I've got this app, and as a parent, I kind of, you know, get to filter what they see. And so I know where they go, and I know where they don't go. And you, my friend, have been duped like the rest of us. And I haven't even begun talking about the algorithm, that word that we all use and none of us understands what it really is. 
That, that means you can be going down the road in your car and you talk to your wife about, hey, I think we might want to eat Chinese today. And all of a sudden on your Facebook feed, there are all these commercials about Chinese restaurants in your neighborhood. Am I alone on that or do you know what I'm talking about? I literally go into my neighbor's house. Weavers, if you're here, I went about a year ago or so. They had, they had reglazed the inside of, the, of the, 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 the garage. And I thought, that's beautiful. D, that's, that's great. That looks great. It's, it smells good. It's, it's fresh. I'm thinking about doing the same thing. Uh, and he gave me some, some thoughts about it and some ideas about where he went. I went home and that night, I kid you not, on my Facebook feed, there were advertisements about reglazing your garage floor. Now, I'm not paranoid. (laughs) But take a middle schooler, a fourth grader, fifth grader, who already is going through the gauntlet of middle school, which is hard enough. It's just so hard to go through that age. And and yet now going through that difficult season, you take a middle schooler who already has some, some issues with how they look, they feel bad about how, how much they weigh or what their complexion looks like. And, and maybe they have some questions about their own identity and their own sexuality. I'm not like the other guys, and they seem more macho than I am. I'm not like the other girls. They seem more effeminate than I am. I don't, I don't know what this means. So we just kind of do our thing, and all of a sudden, message after message after message after message, this is who you are. This is where you go. This is what it's all about. And, and yet, unfiltered, we wonder why Gen Z is the most anxious generation in the history of our species And one of the multiplicity of reasons why is that you and I have failed at sharpening them for a life that is hell-bent on destroying them. And we are sharpened by the love of Jesus, sharpened by the awareness that there is nothing I will face this week that I cannot face with him, sharpened by the reality that no matter where I've been or what I've done, I may be forgiven and made new in Christ. We're sharpened only when we are raised in this faith. And the trouble is you can't, you can't take the first step of learning how to walk in this faith when they move away. It starts now. It starts right now. It starts when they're up here being held or, or just <laughs> may God make every one of our children that comfortable in this place. So I want to suggest two things that we can do, and that's it. I could suggest a dozen, just two. Two ways that we can sharpen our children to be raised in faith so that they might be able to walk in this world that is hell-bent on destroying them. Two simple words. And it's going to seem a little odd. You're going to have to stick with me. The first is this. Stop making it so safe. Stop making it so safe. Can we just agree to do that? We want our kids safe. And that sounds reasonable. I don't want my kids in trouble. I don't want them hurt. Man, you know, we, we bubble wrap our kids these days. Like to go check the mail. Stop making it so safe. We are so risk averted, so risk. We so don't like risk (laughs) that we fear placing our children in any circumstance that has challenge or trouble or trauma or stress or suffering. We're afraid that they will be harmed. Well, but isn't my job as a parent, isn't my number one job to keep them safe? No. I mean, we keep everybody safe. Everybody ought to be kept safe. All the vulnerable, young and old, ought to be kept safe. Is it your number one job to keep your children safe? No. Your number one job in Christ as a parent is to so raise them that they learn to walk by faith and not by sight. Because this world will shape them. This world will impress upon them troubles, and they won't know what to do with them if they haven't learned how to deal with a little bit of trouble down low. Yeah. Yeah. 
See, I don't mean to sound like the old guy, you know, when I was young, I, why, we ate rocks and, and we liked it, you know. No, but we kind of did. I mean, come on. If I wanted to, I could talk a little bit about what it means that, that I mean, we, we used to ride standing up in dad's truck holding on to the roll bar, going 40 miles an hour down the road. Why? Because seat belts are for the weak, right? <laughs> Not really. Don't email me. Not really. I mean, we're the ones who, who played on rusty playground equipment, and if you didn't have your tetanus shot, you might die, right? We played with yard darts. We threw the darts up and then ran so that they wouldn't <laughs> impale you, and if they impaled you, well, you should have run. <laughs> And if anybody knows what I'm talking about, when, you, when you're thirsty outside, you don't come inside. What do you do? You go to the, you drink out of that hose because it has better taste anyway, right? It's flavor. My wife used to tell me stories about how she, well, her parents would lock her outside, lock her and her sister and brother outside, go play. When can I come back? When the lights on the street come on, you come on back. I'm not saying, you know, we should, you know, we, you should feed them, Okay. <laughs> I'm just saying sometimes don't make it so safe, and here's why. If they don't face some risk, if they don't have some trouble, if they don't fall down and break something, they will never know the liberating joy of being rescued by a God who is with them in all circumstances. Yeah. Yeah, they've got to know what it means to call upon the one who is an ever-present help in time of trouble. So that's why the Shema says, talk about it. All the time, talk about it. When you're sitting down, talk about it. When you're standing up, talk about it. Take them when you're walking down the road, talk about it. So instead of when little Sally comes home and says, somebody at school called me a bad name, instead of going to the school and having every official in the county fire the teacher, for mismanagement of the classroom, how about we sit down with little Sally and say, how did it feel? You didn't like it, did you? That hurt. Did you tell Jesus about it yet? Yeah. You know what? Because he's the center of my joy. You know what? In the Bible, little Sally, there are whole pages called the Psalms where people would get so angry at something that was done wrong and they, they tell God about it. They'd even yell at God and say, God, I'm mad at this and I'm mad at them and I'm mad at you for a little while. So why don't we read one of those together? Can we talk about it? Can we pray about it? You know what it, it even says in the New Testament, little Sally? It even says that sometimes in this life you will be hurt and mom and dad are here with you. And it's okay, but you know who else is? Jesus is. And he says, that maybe if you learn to pray for the one who has hurt you. Now, I'm not saying we teach our kids to be doormats. Not at all. One day, Jackson came home from school, and he, uh, this kid on the school bus kept kind of messing with him. And he'd jump over on him. He'd keep jumping over on Jackson, kind of, kind of bullying him a little bit, you know. And he'd come home and talk to me about it, and we'd, we'd talk about what to do about it. And we, we said, well, look, just, you know, Try not to be overreactive. Next thing we know, we get, a, we get an email. We get a, a text or an email from the, the kid's parent with a picture. Your son stabbed my son. Oh, God, what happened? Jackson, what'd you do? He said, nothing. I was, I was just on the, on the school bus, and you said don't, you know, don't overreact. So I just stood there. I just sat there on my, on my, my seat, and he kept bumping into me. All I did was hold a tack on my, th on my leg here. He jumped into it, right? And so simultaneously, at the same time, I'm like, yeah, you can't do that. But at the same time, I'm like, yes, yes, you go and get that, get that, right? Come on. I'm not saying they should be doormats. Yeah, they got to take care of themselves. But at the same time, I'm saying we sharpen them when they're young to recognize this world is not going to roll out a red carpet for you. This world will break you. So let me introduce you to someone down here at this age who will put you back together when you are broken. Yeah, yeah. So the one thing that I say to us, the first thing in sharpening our children to be raised in church is don't make it so safe. The second and last thing is this. The faith you want for them must first be seen in you. The faith you want in them must first be seen 
in you. Did you notice that in the Shema, before it said anything at all about what to tell your children, it said, this thing must be on your heart. This thing must be on your heart. There was a student who asked a rabbi one day, why is it that God said you should put the law upon your hearts? Why doesn't God say you should put the law in your hearts? And the rabbi said, well, because in this life, our hearts can become hard. And you put the law upon your heart so that when your heart breaks, God's love and law falls in. The faith that we want for them must first be seen in us. That's why in this passage, did you notice how many times the word you is used in this verse? Read it again. Impress upon them your, your, upon your children. Um, talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road. When you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them on your foreheads. Write them down on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. The faith that we want in them must first be seen in us. So what do I mean by that? I mean, let them see it in you. Yeah, but I don't have scripture memorized and I don't have the answers to their complex questions. I'm not talking about that. Here's what I'm talking about. When you fight with your spouse, let them see it. Don't shut the door. Well, shut the door sometimes. <laughs> Other times, if they don't see you fight, they won't see what it looks like to humble yourself and go back to the other one and say, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Will you forgive me? That's what it means to tie it upon your head and upon your arm. Show them what it looks like in you to pray. Let them see you worship. Let them hear the sound of the, the turning of pages. From their room in the morning before they wake up, let them hear you make the sounds of your own study in the word. Let them know that when dad is sitting in this chair, that means he's talking to the Lord. When mom is sitting over there in this space, she's spending some time with the Lord and needs a minute. Just leave her alone. She's praying about you probably. Let them see it in you and let them see your love for your church. But what if I don't feel like coming to church? Fake it. (laughs) What if I'm too tired? Fake it. But what if we went last Sunday? Fake it. Because guess what? Sundays come around once every week. Because if we don't teach them to create the muscle fibers, the muscle memory, the sinew, the the tissues of their, their soul formation, they will never learn to long for it. And the moment they leave your place... There will not be a hunger that they are missing something. They must be, when did, now this is another rant. Man, my worst rants are after 12 o'clock, so (laughs) I'll make it quick. I got to tell you, when did Sunday become optional? I don't mean like culturally speaking, sociologically speaking. When We can talk about that. I mean for you. When did it become optional for you? Because (laughs) their homework isn't optional. Their medicine isn't optional. Their food isn't optional. The doctor's vi- dentist visits is not optional. The, it's not optional for them to, to go to practice if they're going to play on the field. It's not optional to, to somehow skip soccer. It's not optional for them to skip that, <laughs> that pitching coach that you hired for a high dollar because he is definitely the next Greg Maddox. Yes, he's, he's three years old, but he's going to be the Greg Maddox. And so it's not optional because we paid too much money for it. But how did Sunday become optional? I speak to so many friends and they're just tired. And like, but I'm, I'm, I'm so, I work all week long and I work every day and there's nothing left. And actually Sunday mornings are the only time that I can be with my family and rest and take a breath. And I want to say, who taught you to say yes to every other commitment Monday through Saturday so that the only no you have in your pocket is the no that you reserve for your Lord and Savior on a Sunday morning? Beloved, if we are to raise them prepared for a world hell bent on their destruction, they've got to get here. And most of them, last I looked, can't drive themselves. 
And if we get them here, I can promise you one thing. Every last person who stood up in this room a moment ago is here to help you raise them. And the trouble is, sometimes we think about young families coming in with their, their kids these days, and we think, oh, well, that's nice. Oh, that's, that's noble. That's good. They're here. When you see, I'm talking to the rest of us, when you see a young family with young children showing up on any given Sunday morning, it's not commendable. It's phenomenal. Given all the challenges that they have, it's phenomenal that they've made a choice to be here. So let's not let them down. Let's help them raise their children in the faith. I remember when we first came here. Oh, it's going to be 1.30, I'm sure, by the time we're finished. I remember when we first came here, I'm sitting on the front pew. And my son Jackson used to be, you know, fourth grade when we first moved here, and and he would sit with me every Sunday. Some of you remember that because you were here, and he would sit with me every Sunday till I get up to preach, and he's right there, and he's right there in case I need to, you know, he's he's close enough to do a thing. And, and, And yet, during that time, we had a church member who's watching at home now because she can't come as frequently due to some physical challenges, Marion Wise. You know Marion Wise? Jackson became friends with Miss Marion. And she, she befriended him. And one day, Marion was not at church. And Jackson, during one of the hymns, leans over and says, where's the lady? And I said, what lady? The lady with the black hair and the, the bright red lipstick. She's so nice. And it occurred to me as a fourth grader, he was in a relationship with another person not in our family who was singing when we were singing, praying when we were praying, and others need people outside your family group to to help show them the way of faith, to raise them in the church. You ought to bring your kids here if for no other reason than to walk through entrance A and let Fred show your sons and daughters how to shake a hand. Right? Come on. I I think I've, I think I've, I'm about to overcook the grits now. I think, I think you know what I'm saying. I think the Lord is speaking today. Let's be that kind of church, beloved, one who pays attention to each other when we show up and don't take it for granted. Let's pay attention to those who come in dragging kids behind them, kicking and screaming. Let's teach them what we had to teach our own. Let's teach them that when the kids in the morning say, I don't want to go, it's boring, I'm so tired, I don't want to wear these clothes, then I'm going to give you a phrase that worked in my family because my wife practiced this again and again and again. It's a very pastoral, very compassionate phrase, and you can use it. Get your butt in the car, we're going to church. In the name of Jesus. Now, friends, we've come to this time in our worship service where maybe you're hearing the things that I'm saying and you're like, yes, right on. I'm here. I will be here and be that church at 6910. I will be the church that helps these young uh, moms and dads raise their children. But it may be that you're one of us that I'm talking about and you recognize that in order for you to raise your family in the faith, something has to be firmed up in your own heart. That's why right now I want to give you the opportunity to make that commitment before the one who sees you and hears you and loves you and has called you here. It's not by accident that you're here. It might be that you're here right now and you recognize the stirring that you have inside. It's because the Spirit is calling you to commitment, to do something for your family that supersedes every other good thing you think you can give your family better than a good income, better than a fine education, better than a a nice place to live, a faith that will go with them the rest of their lives. During this time, it may be that you need a voice of prayer that sounds something like this. Right where you are, you simply pray these words, God, I recognize that more is needed of me, and it's not my own efforts. It's not my own ideas. It's not my own desire to be a good dad or a good mother. What's needed of me is more trust in you. What's needed of me is to yield my life to your lordship and to commit to bring my family to this place where we honor you, Lord, and we worship you and we we are shaped by your love. So right now, I, I quit. I quit pretending. And I, I quit being dragged to this place by somebody. And I commit my heart 
to you fully. That you would so shape my mind and my heart and my actions that the ones who live in my home see a difference because you have made a difference, God. It all begins right now. And I pray that in your holy name. Amen. So friends, you, you may have prayed that prayer or something like that, and I want you to know that that is a fantastic first step. The second step is to tell somebody about it. Just like I told these parents up here, you can't do it by yourself. Well, neither can you. That's why my pastors are coming up front to take position at the front of these stairs so that at the conclusion of the benediction in just a moment, they will be here to listen to you and to pray with you, to pray a prayer of recommitment in your faith. It may be that some of you come today for the very first time to say, I am giving my life to Jesus Christ right here and right now. It might be that you come forward and say, I'm ready to walk into the waters of baptism and let the world know that I am his and he is mine. It may be that you come today and tell one of us, you want to be in this church family, to become a member of JCBC, to let 6910 be your spiritual home. Don't wait another week. Come and tell somebody about that today. And now it's time for us to come to that moment in worship that is the most important moment. It's not the sermon. It's not the singing. It's the moment when this gathering becomes a scattering and we live outside these walls in such a way as to demonstrate to the world we actually believe what we have affirmed inside these walls. So as you're able, would you stand to your feet for the benediction? And now wherever it is that you go from this place, may Christ go before you to prepare your way. May Christ go behind you on the days that you fear and feel like retreating to encourage you one step further at a time. May Christ go to your right and Christ to your left, abiding closer than even a sister or a brother. May Christ go above you on the days that dark clouds roll in to remind you there is one above the clouds who at the end of the day has the final word. May Christ go beneath you, girding you with confidence and removing all forms of fear. And mostly may Christ go in you, transforming you from the inside out until your hearts beat in rhythm.